Hello, everybody. So I guess we can start. So let me welcome you on, on my session today. Uh, I'm Jan Kara from Swiss Labs, working on performance teams. Uh, on performance team, uh, and this is a session about tracing eBPF, how to look into what your system is doing, uh, gathering some information about it. Uh, now this session is meant to be interactive uh, as much as possible, so uh, and also so that you can try out things as I'm speaking and as I'm, uh, I will be also demonstrating some stuff so you can try the same thing on your computer. Uh, also, so feel free to talk, feel free to interrupt me, uh, have questions like how do I do this and that. If you have particular problem, I'll be happy to share what I know. Uh, basically, uh, what I will show is how to use the trace, tracing infrastructure that we have in the kernel and eBPF. Uh, support that we have in the kernel for debugging the kernel. It, it works actually not only for the kernel, but part of the stuff works also on the user space. So I will mention this, these things. So uh, in this session, basically, I want to cover BCC tools, which is a set of tools which is using eBPF and tracing uh, for a kernel for like system introspection. Uh, also, I'll be speaking a bit about flame graphs, which is a way of visualization profiling data. So I will show how, how to generate the graphs and how to read them. Uh, and in the end, if there is time, I will speak a bit about like that this is actually easy to create your own debugging tools like this that are going to process data. Uh, what I want to also show that it's really convenient and easy to use in our distribution. So if you are debugging issues or analyzing, like working with customers to debug issues, then it is actually quite easy to use these tools or instruct customer to use these tools. So BCC tools, that's the first thing I'm uh, talking. I, I've sent yesterday a uh, message into the Labs Conference uh, chat. Uh, that uh, you can pre-install some tools. If you don't have it installed and you want to try stuff, then please install BCC tools package. And uh, if, if you, you also, if you don't have it already installed, install perf package. We will need it later during the presentation. So uh, BCC stands for BPF Compiler Collection. It was created by Brandon Grex and others. Uh, it is actually a set of around 130 various debugging tools that get installed under user share BCC tools in our distribution. Uh, so obviously I will not talk about all those 130, I will just pick out a few interesting ones, but you know, if you are interested, then you know, I suggest you go through those tools, see what they are doing. There are various tools for introspecting file systems, networking, or general performance tools uh, under that. Uh, the package actually has dependencies which also install necessary compilers like LLVM compiler, which is used to compile the C pseudocode into eBPF bytecode, which is then loaded into the kernel. It also installs some Python bindings and it installs also necessary kernel packages with the include files which are needed for compiling the eBPF programs. Uh, so basically out of this, the interesting part, it's the kernel packages part, because we don't compile kernel with the type information, like the config BTF option. So for BCC tools to work, it has to have access to the include files from the kernel you are running. Uh, in our distribution, this means that it needs to have the kernel devel and uh, kernel default devel packages uh, for the currently running kernel. And because of the way how we package stuff, it's actually not so easy as only installing these two packages because the, where we install them and how we install them is incompatible <laughs> with what BCC needs. So you need to create a couple of symlinks for the stuff to start working. So that's about the only like odd corner case uh, that is in our distribution currently. So I've tried on my Leap 15.4 laptop. Uh, maybe it's different on Dumbleweed, but I don't think so. I didn't try. But anyway, uh, like the point is that 
there is like you need to basically uh, in under lip modules directory yeah, where the modules are stored uh, it expects that the build actually leads to the directory where the kernel sources are or where the include files are so so this needs this symlink needs to be created uh, and then also because like we separate the static include files from the include files that are generating during kernel build, we have them in separate directories, like the the ob uh, include files that are generated during kernel build are in the directory that has this dash object suffix. So so we need to actually link those three, two trees together. So. If you want to, uh, so yeah, you need to basically link from this object directory into this basic, into the, the, this base include tree. So, oh, okay, you don't need. To, okay, for tumbleweed it works out of the box. Okay, that's great. So only for this is needed only for leap, as I have been told. So so that's great. Uh, okay, so let's move on. Uh, like this, this should be all that's needed to prepare and we are now ready to start running with tools. So let's try with a trivial tool. You need to run as root. As, I, as you can see, I am under the user share BCC tools directory. So uh, I have this, I can run this exec snoop tool, which is actually uh, going to trace all the exec syscalls that are happening in the system. So, you know, if I, say line, launch terminal here and close it, then you can see that uh, there have been a couple of exec syscalls happening. So, so it has, like here you can see PID, you can see parent PID, you can see what actually uh, was getting executed and exactly what, what were the uh, arguments uh, of the executable that were executed. So this is a, just kind of trivial thing, uh, but it's a good, like, basic demonstration that it works. Okay, uh, another tool which is a bit more interesting is, uh, for example, BioSnoop, which you can try to run just without any arguments. Uh, actually, the, uh, most of the tools also have like the help, which is giving basic description of what the tool does and what options it is able to take. But anyway, BioSnoop, as the name suggests, actually tracks the IOs that are happening in the system. In a way, it's similar to what BlockTrace would be doing, but yeah, I can run, run like find. And here you can see that there was tracing happening of all the IOs that were happening. So here I can see like the timestamp, the command that was running the IO, its PID, to which disk the IO was going, whether it was read or write, sector and length of the IO, and also the time it took the IO to complete. So with this you can trace anything. You can try with arbitrary stuff that's doing IO. Again, like this is nothing new in principle. We have already different tools like block trace that are able to give you similar kind of information, but you know it shows kind of the capabilities which which this, these tools have. So yeah, you can try with various things, and then we will. I will show another thing, and that's actually. Bio latency tool, and that, that's already kind of shows. Uh, so that's tool which actually shows the latency of each I/O, and that actually already starts showing the value uh, which these like eBPF programs have compared to ordinary to uh, debugging tools we have. So yeah, let's let's try to run it just without anything. We can. Again, like run find to generate some I.O. You can see there is nothing printed yet. It's because the tool is just gathering information in the kernel. Yeah? And now when the tool is terminated, I will hit Control C. Then basically it was gathering the information all the time in the kernel without having to exit to user space. 
And now when I stopped it, it has printed me a histogram of the latency of the IOs that were happening. Now there are ways to actually tune uh, how, how the IOs are actually gathered. But basically, often the problem with the debugging is that it generates too, many, too much data. Yeah? So for example, if you are tracing some IO intensive application and uh, then just the amount of data you have to propagate from the kernel space to user space is influencing your workload. Uh, or it is just, you know, the buffers are overflowing and just too much to handle. And uh, so with these tools, you can actually gather all this information inside the kernel, process, do the statistics inside the kernel, and only propagate the results out when the program finishes. Now you can also configure the tool uh, to say, write these statistics, write out these statistics every 10 seconds or however you want. Uh, or if you have some particular specialties, how you want to limit the IOs, you can do this. Either the tool already may have the option, or you can use, like you can, it's very easy to just tweak the tool to do exactly what you need. This is often the case, like these are not meant to be finished tools, like they do useful stuff, but if they don't do what you need, it's because these are essentially scripts, as we see in a while, it's very easy to just take them, tweak them to do what you exactly need, and use them for the particular problem you have. So here we can see that uh, we can here we can see the latency histogram. Basically, how to read it is that basically about 16,000 IOs were completed within 64 and 127 mic uh, microseconds. Yeah. There were some IOs that, that took actually up to 255 microseconds. There were even one IO that took up to 16 milliseconds. So that's about the BioSnoop tool, uh, or bio latency tool, sorry. Uh, if there are any more questions or people want to try more, then feel free, or if you have some suggestions what else to try. Yeah, no? Okay, so then we can move on to another tool, uh, which is RunQLED. So you can try RunQLED, and on 15.4 actually, oh, sorry, so I wanted to uh, demonstrate something else, but I had it, so, you know, this is actually, sorry, so the, the tool, if you, as you would install it, I'm not sure if you are trying, but if you would try, it would actually fail. On 15.4, it tends to fail like this. Uh, and that's actually also a useful thing to know and be aware about BPF tools. And it's because the BPF script, which is there, it hooks into the kernel internals. Yeah? It essentially loads into the kernel, looks into the internal kernel. Uh, basically, the, the script is compiled as it is loaded into the kernel. And it looks into the kernel inter internal data structures. So basically, it has the same problem as if you were writing kernel module. If the kernel changes, the tool just stops working. Uh, so in this case, actually, the task struct has changed since the tool was written, uh, and the state field in the struct doesn't exist anymore. And that's what the LLVM compiler is complaining about here, that the state simply doesn't exist. Uh, and what you need to do in such cases is you need to look into the tool, kind of look into the kernel, try to guess what needs to be done to the tool to make it working again. Yeah. So obviously, without at least basic kernel knowledge, it's, it's a bit difficult. But in this particular case, if you look around the structure, you will quickly find out that the state field got just renamed to a different name. Now it's called underscore underscore state, because the accessor functions should be used to access this state. So there is, uh, luckily for the checking whether the task is running or not, uh, the checking for equality with the task running state still works 
correctly. So all we need to do is really to replace the state with underscore underscore state, and things should work. So if we now run the tool, as you can see, it now compiles fine, and the module is inserted into the kernel. Uh, and what the tool does is actually it measures the run queue, uh, run queue latency, which Giovanni was briefly mentioning in his talk this morning. So basically, run queue latency is the thing that when the task in principle could run, but there are other tasks that are currently running, then it has to wait. Yeah, it's in a runnable state, but it has to wait until it gets to the CPU. And this waiting time is what's called the run queue latency. Uh, and so if we like overload the kernel a bit, like this machine has like eight CPUs. So let's run some compilation with 64 processes to make it kind of more interesting. Yeah, so now, now there are 64 processes trying to compile the kernel. So uh, obviously some processes will be waiting uh, for the CPU. Uh, and yeah, I can stop it now. And let's see the run queue latency. Yeah? So, so this is now the distribution of the run queue latency. And this is one of the cases where if you would actually rep be reporting every like task switching even, then even, then it would be really a lot of data. As you can see, it would be hundreds, hundreds of thousands of events just for this short moment when the tool was running. Uh, so, so this is really unfeasible to propagate all this information to user space. You really need to do the pre-processing in the kernel. Uh, so here we see that most of the latency was like two to seven microseconds. And then we, ca we have some larger peaks likely when the compilation, like these num low numbers were likely when the compilation was not yet running, yeah, when the compilation started, the like, uh, run queue latency started to increase. Uh, we could actually, uh, so like the largest run, run queue latency was there around 65 milliseconds. Yeah. We can even like uh, make it, I believe, report once in a while. Yeah. We can run it with an interval argument, so we can like make it output run queue latency every five seconds. So here you can see now, now the latency is really low, yeah, only 31 microseconds. Now if I kind of overload a bit with running lots of compilation, you can see as the run queue latency has now increased, as the tasks are now competing for the CPU. So these are useful tools uh, for introspecting the kernel. So these are the basic tools that should be mostly understandable to everyone in, the, in this room. As I said, there are like many more specialized tools. Uh, yeah, as, I, as you can see, really a lot of tools here. Uh, but yeah, I guess there is no point in me going over all the tools that are there. Probably everybody has something else interesting there. Uh, so just walk over these tools and find you, what you be interesting for the subsystem you are working on. Or just get inspiration and update some tools for your subsystem. Uh, yeah, this I already went through. So. Uh, as I said, basically each tool is comprised of two parts. Basically, the C code that, that or pseudo C, it's not completely C, uh, gets compiled into eBPF bytecode, and that's tightly coupled with the kernel, so it may need updating. And then there is some Python part, uh, which actually makes sh handles the compilation and loading of the stuff into the kernel and then generation of the output. And that's actually pretty neat. We'll see it towards the end of the presentation that the Python part is very convenient to use uh, and like for the output generation or processing of command line options and stuff like this. Okay, uh, I've already covered this. Uh, so. Then another tool I will be speaking about, and that's, that's 
thing that, for example, I frequently need to know or I'm frequently curious about when I'm working on some performance program problem, and that's like to find out how long function execution takes. Yeah. Uh, so, I, I, for example, I have some performance problem. I suspect that we are really spending time here, or this is where the regression happened between two kernels. So I want to see how long this function took in one kernel and how long it takes in another kernel. And for this, there is already a ready-made tool in BCC, and that's called Funk Latency, which prints the histogram of the function execution time. Uh, it allows you not only to specify a single function, but uh, you can also specify multiple functions, or you can specify a regular expression, and then basically all the functions that match the regular expression will be traced together. And they're, they're like, this is useful, for example, when uh, some syscall has uh, multiple entry points and you want to trace all of them in a single trace, then, then it's useful to use the regular expressions thing. Uh, this can trace all, not only the kernel parts, but this can trace any arbitrary function, even user space one or some library. So you can, I will show in an example how you can also trace, say, the execution time of some libc function. Uh, Similarly, as previously, it has support for, say, printing the histogram of the execution times every n seconds and other stuff. So, uh, you know, he, here you can see the basic information how to run it. Uh, so, here I will, for example, get the latency of like fsync syscall. Uh, so VFS fsync range is a function that executes in the kernel when you call fsync. Uh, and mm, this is not the one I need. Yeah, this is this is one I'm accepting. So so yeah, I'll run this to get the latency. Yeah, the program is now ready to you, so I will run here dd command. That's actually just doing synchronous write, so basically it will do four kilobyte write, then call fsync, or internally in the kernel it will actually call fsync. Yeah. And then, then it will do another write. And here I can see uh, the latency. Okay, this is pretty boring. Uh, but yeah, you can see the calls were taking around between four and eight uh, milliseconds actually. To, call, to do the f-sync, or basically to call the, like from the beginning to the end of the VFS f-sync range function, it took some 130, mm, uh, it took some four to eight milliseconds. Uh, okay, you can find, uh, think whatever other function you would like to take, uh, like check, I'll show here, so here, I can now look into how long a write function is going to take. This is going to be a bit more interesting. So let me run the same DD again. Uh, so now I am tracing. Oh, okay, that was that. Oh no, it's it's more interesting. There are actually more histograms because there are now more more processes that that were executing that were executing the write function in C. Yeah, because it was not only this DD that was executing the writes, uh, but there were also many other programs that called write, C write function while I was running this. So you can see that, for example, there, the process with PID 26508 yeah, was executing one write, and it was taking between 8 and 16 microseconds. Yeah, uh, Here, this is the histogram or on the top you can see the histogram for, for my DD likely. That's the PID 26503 that was like those 128 things that were happening there as part of the write system call. So, so they were taking really long from 4 to 16 milliseconds this time. And then they were at, then there were other processes that were calling write, like usually the terminal writes yeah, and other stuff that were pretty quick, so taking just a couple of microseconds. 
So, so that's a way how you can trace even latency of, of like any library function. So you can, basically the syntax is that you just write the library name, so C is here for libc, but you can have their thread for libthread or whatever other zlib for, for, for you know, like gzip library and stuff like this. So that's about tracing individual functions. If anyone has any suggestions, ideas, questions, feel free to ask. If not, then, then we can go uh, further. So, so, so there, is, uh, there are, related to functions, there are several other there are several other tools that are here. So, so func count uh, is the function that uh, prints uh, the number of times particular function was called. That can be occasionally interesting as well. Uh, func interval that's uh, reporting actually. So func latency returns how long the function took to execute. Func interval tells you how long was the time before the function was called, yeah? So, so, like how frequently, essentially it tells how frequently the function got called, yeah? So, so basically, uh, func latency shows the latency between start and end, and func interval shows the latency between, end, uh, between start and start of the next invocation. So, uh, that can be useful at times as well. Uh, Functslower is another helper which basically reports whenever the function takes longer than some predefined period. Yeah, we can. So so you can uh, and it will actually dump the stack when this happens. So like I can, for example, again. Uh, say print, I don't know what, uh, yeah, we can say the minimal timestamp for, mi uh, for milliseconds. So basically now I want to print all bright calls in the libc library that are taking more than four milliseconds. Yeah. So there is nothing happening here if I run here this, yeah, you can, uh, this call, you can see that, yes, th these calls were generally slower, so, yeah. Uh, here you can see the latency, actually how long each each call took, so it was like the first call to actu took actually 16 milliseconds, Th then the other calls were generally fast, to taking between four and five milliseconds usually, at least those that were longer than, uh, that were longer than four milliseconds. And as I mentioned, you can also instruct this to dump me the stack trace. So for example, so I, I've asked it to dump only the kernel stack trace at this point. Oh, why it isn't? Oh yeah, that's no, okay. So I cannot really dump kernel stack trace when I'm tracing user space function yet. It doesn't make sense. Think, but if I trace kernel function, or then it, it will be showing me where actually the, the functions that take longer than four milliseconds, where they were actually called from. So if I'm like looking, uh, so the, here I can see the stack traces like where these calls that took longer than some threshold where they will ca call from. And similarly, I can tra trace the user space. Yeah, I just have to remember. I don't remember the exact option number, but uh, or option name. I can yeah u minus u. So if I write here minus u, and say trace the right call, then uh, I should be seeing here. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I don't have, okay, so it doesn't quite give anything interesting because I don't have debug symbols for this stuff. So 
like to get decent traces from, from the user space, you obviously have to have debug symbols installed, which I don't have at this point, so it's not showing anything very interesting on my laptop. But if you had installed uh, debug symbols for the libc library and for the DD package, then it would be showing you uh, the traces where the function executions that took longer than your threshold are happening from, yeah? Uh, here's my question. Uh, you said you did not have uh, debug symbols for the user space stacks, but the kernel stacks worked. Is it uh, because you have to debug info for the kernel, or does it use the BTF information? So uh, the kernel stack traces are actually gathered within the kernel, and kernel internally is able to unwind the stack. Okay, so even without the even without the debug info, uh, yeah, because that that's using standard like. Stack, stack dumping that uh, facility that's within the kernel, where you can like be generated on oops or stack traces that we generate. So it's the same. It's the same code. code, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So the stack traces, yeah. I have a question about the library tracing that you have. So I understand how you can install these traces to the kernel. I'm wondering if for libraries, do you need to compile your libraries with something specific like a entry with ops or anything like that? Uh, that's a good question, and I'm not sure. I believe yes. Uh, so, so, but I, uh, so these are default packages. If we ship them, as we ship them, I'm not sure how actually it works to attach uh, attaching to the entry points to the function in libraries. So in kernel, we have there the knobs at the beginning and end. Essentially, under the hood, it's using ftrace to be able to hook into arbitrary kernel functions uh, for the user space. I'm, I believe there's the same facility, essentially, like SF trace available for all the binaries these days. We use it for live patching and stuff like this. And, and so I believe this is the facility that is used under the hood. But yeah, I don't know the technical details about the library parts. Maybe our toolchain guys or live patching guys would know better. <laughs> OK. So. Let's move on to flame graphs. Yeah. So uh, flame graphs are a way to visualize profiling data. So in principle, there is no more information that than you can get from like perf report. Uh, it's just visualized in a useful manner so that it's easier to read. And then we will also get to a bit more like unusual types of frame graphs which are actually not, not readily available from perf. So yeah, if you don't have perf installed, then now it's a really good time to install it if you want to experiment with this. Also, we will need some scripts uh, which are in the GitHub repository from Brandon Gregg. So like, please clone this or otherwise <laughs> download it to your laptop uh, because we will need a few to tools from there if you want to experiment. Now, the basic way how to gather so-called on-CPU flame graphs, so basically standard visualization into where the CPU time is spent, is to gather perf record. So basically with this first line, uh, with perf, yeah, we instrument perf to gather stack trace 99s per second, uh, and yeah, minus g means uh, like gather a full stack trace, yeah, and sleep. I will be gathering this for 30 seconds, or maybe we can gather for a bit shorter time. But so uh, yeah, I now just have to find. Yeah, I think the PID. Yeah, the idea of the Firefox still works for me. So this will be a bit boring trace, but OK. Uh, so I'll, uh, it is now gathering stack traces from the Fire, one of the Firefox threads that's, that's running on my computer. This is actually the rendering thread of the Firefox. So here I can give it some work to, to render stuff. Yeah, here are some chats uh, in our company. So yeah. We can give some work to Firefox. Uh, we can even open a new tab, yeah, whatever. Okay. 
so it has now gathered standard stack traces. Now uh, we can post process these stack traces uh, by collapsing stacks that are identical or that have the same beginning. And for this, we need the stack collapse tool, uh, which is in the Brandon Gregg's flame graph repository. So to do this, basically, we call perf script. Uh, and yeah, I have cloned it into my home directory source flame graph stack collapse. So yeah. I'm now going to execute this. I don't know where you cloned the repository, but yeah. And then uh, we have, uh, so that's generated the folded file. That's actually user readable. Here you can see all the stack traces which are kind of folded one after another. Now this is not very nice, but it's normal textual file. And now we can use the flame graph tool, which is st again, And generate as and it generates SVG file, which we can then open. Here. Yeah, so this is actually there is very tall column here at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, this is actually where the time was spent for the rendering thread. Uh, here the time was spent in SVG composite. Uh, you can, the nice thing about this is that it's clickable. So, so for example, if I have this column, I don't see what's there, I can click on it. Yeah, it's some user space stack. Again, I don't have user space debug symbols, but here I can see that it was like spending some time in allocating, allocating in the kernel uh, for sending messages. Yeah, here we can see that again, like most of the in kernel stuff that Firefox spends time is actually allocating memory. <laughs> uh, also, we can see that it was spent time uh, like somewhere executing some reads and processing yeah, some time on Peter at Mutex. You can click back basically to undo the visualization yeah, here. Okay, not, not much interesting here. Like we can have a look what's this column, for example. This is like some few text Futex stack. So uh, basically here the Firefox was spinning on some Futex waiting for something. So this is a way to visualize, visualize profiling data. Uh, as I already said, basically if you did perf report in principle, you could see the percentages and the trees. So, so this is not that like interesting compared to standard per report, but still uh, it gives nice visualization of like where the bulk of the time is spent. That actually can be seen pretty quickly from the flame graph. Okay, now the problem with gathering flame graphs like this is that you have to record the stack uh, every time you basically take a trace. Yeah, that's why we did only 99 times per second. Uh, now there is a cheaper way to do this. Uh, so uh, you can gather the stack already in the kernel instead of having perf gather it in user space uh, and uh, already collapse the stack in the kernel. And BCC tools has a tool called profile uh, which does this. So basically it will in the kernel gather the stack trace. We can again specify the frequency. Uh, we can specify minus F, which means already fold the stacks in user space, which means that it will like deduplicate the stacks already in user space. Uh, and yeah, we will gather it for, again, we can gather it for 30 seconds. And so yeah, we, maybe f to make it interesting, yeah, we can, so minus k minus f, what I need more, yeah, frequency. Okay, yeah, I can keep having there 99. Uh, I'll be gathering for 30 seconds, okay. And yeah, here I can run, say, tar. So uh, I will run tar to like compress the kernel. So, so this is a command which will compress the kernel source. 
uh, and maybe to make it more interesting, uh, I will drop caches so that the kernel has to be reading uh, one more. Yeah, so that the kernel actually has to be reading also some stuff from disk because the kernel source is obviously cached on my computer. So, yeah, so let me, oh, yeah, and let me execute this. Yeah, it, it's now gathering the information for 30 seconds and it will then show basically what the CPUs were doing when the tar archive was being created. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, now, yeah, you can see that already we have lost a couple of stack traces, not much, but yeah, there were more stack traces than it was able to. So, so we could also increase the kernel buffers uh, for for the stuff, but okay. Mm, no. uh, yeah, okay, so I've generated the flame graph and let's have a look how it looks like now. But yeah, so, so here you can see, like mo most of the CPU time was actually spent by gzip, compressing the stuff, yeah. Also, as you can see, the terminal actually, which was scrolling, <laughs> XT terminal, which was scrolling with the uh, files that are being worked on, spent significant amount of CPU time, which was a bit surprising to me, actually. Uh, and you can see it has been spending also time in some system calls, like getting ti uh, ti current time, apparently. Seem to be relatively expensive and polling on whether there is something interesting in the uh, to do. So yeah, I didn't know that terminal I/O actually takes so much these days. Uh, and then obviously Tar was doing quite a bit of work, so, so doing like studying various files, reading files from uh, disk. So this is still CPU time, but still there is like noticeable. Uh, noticeable amount of CPU overhead in this. Yeah, so obviously this is compared to other CPUs doing nothing, so yeah, this didn't take that much overall. Yeah, and then we have here various noise from other applications that are still running on this computer, yeah. So this is, for example, some kernel work. Uh, this is kernel thread that was doing the decryption of my partition while, while the tar was reading it, yeah, uh, or encryption encryption of the gzip archive that was written to the partition. So so this was the kernel thread. And I believe, yeah, this is, for example, some, something communicating over network, yeah. So you can see various stuff that was happening on my system here. Okay, so that was uh, about profiling. Uh, now, more interesting, at least for me, uh, or like what I find even more interesting is the of CPU flame graphs. So, so standard flame graphs were showing essentially where the CPU time is spent. That's kind of standard thing with the profiling. Now, what we often need to do is to find out where the tasks are actually blocked and how long they are blocked there and possibly the reasons why they are blocked there. And for this, uh, there is this of CPU time tool, which is part of BCC tools again and we will use the flame graph script to actually process the output. So I can basically do, do the same tar experiment, but now with the of CPU time. So basically it will show me where the wall clock time in the system is essentially spent, yeah. How long the tools are blocked in various places and for how long they are blocked there. So, So for this, there is of CPU minus K means that I only want kernel traces because I don't have user space stuff anyway. Yeah, for this, it doesn't really make sense to uh, to tra trace the whole system because basically in the whole system, a lot of the stuff is just sleeping, waiting for input from the network, waiting for incoming connection. So, so that wouldn't be really 
that much interesting. So I will directly trace only the tar, uh, only the tar. I will uh, directly trace only the tar uh, process. Yeah, let me drop also the caches so that we have to do more IO and wait more. Okay. And let's start again creating the tar archive and start gathering this info. will run again, it will gather the information for 30 seconds. Yeah. And yeah, it should be done in a moment. And then we will, yeah, it's done now. So I can abort the creation of the tar archive. And we can now again process it with a flame graph. So, oh, sorry. It's, uh, I will now choose a different color, color palette. Uh, and I will use this of CPU folded. and generate the SVG. So here I can open it. Yep, here you can see it. So you can see that it was about, e the, the wall clock time was about equally spread between the reading and writing. So reading actually was happening uh, from the, uh, from the partition, yeah, th th there is most of the, time was actually spent in getting really file data into memory, but there was also a bit of time spent here where we can see that we were actually waiting on file system metadata and directory data to get loaded uh, into, into memory. So that was also where part of the wall clock time was spent. Uh, on the right side, uh, we, will, we were mostly spending time writing to the pipe so piping stuff to, to gzip to compress it, yeah. So that's where the time is spent. Now I will, uh, there are, I will not demonstrate this one, I will just tell you what, what it is. So sometimes it is not only interesting to see where the task is spent sleeping, but uh, it is also interesting to see who actually was waking up the processes that were sleeping here. Because often like we block for someone else to do the work and we are interested who is actually responsible for doing the work for us. So why are we waiting for him? And for this, there is two, uh, like wake up time is measuring uh, the, again, like time, I went to sleep till the time I was woken up, but it's not associated with the stack of the process that is waiting, but it gets associated with the stack of the process that is waking up. So we can see actually the processes that are responsible for the longest wake up times, that, that are those that will be like showing as taking large amount of space in the, uh, in the flame graph. Uh, and there is a com we can combine these two traces, like the sleeping of CPU gra uh, flame graph with the waking of CPU crane graph, uh, in something which is called off-wake flame graph or sometimes chain graph. Uh, and I can demonstrate this one. So for this, we have a tool in BCC tools that's called off-wake time. So kind of, it's very similar to of CPU time. Uh, and I believe, yeah, I can use it on the same. Uh, I maybe just speed it a bit only to take 20 seconds. Yeah, and let me drop caches first again. Yeah can start the tar, now I can start the tool. Uh, 
Yeah, so it's gathering the information now. Uh, yep. Uh, and I can regenerate the flame graph now. I've gathered it to the same. Uh, so it should be like here. If I now reload it. Oh yeah, uh, I wanted to change the color palette now. So I will choose a color palette chain and that, so that it's better visible. Uh, so, so here we can see again the same sleeping graphs. Uh, I here we see the read and here we see the bright. And here on the other side we will see who was waking the reader. Yeah? And mostly we see that it was well, not very surprisingly in this case it was like and I.O. processing. So basically there was a kernel thread that was processing the interrupt, that was completing the I.O.s, and that was when the I.O. Uh, like I.O. completion got processed. Uh, and yes, I have the de device mapper on this laptop which is doing encryption and stuff like this, so it's, it's been hidden behind kernels, various kernel K worker threads, but these were in the end waking up my read system calls that was blocked waiting for page data to be filled in. Uh, here it may be a bit more interesting, uh, but in principle it will be very similar. Yeah? So again, this, this is waiting for the directory data to get loaded into, into memory. And here on the other side we can see that who was waking it up was like this buffer head code this was, that was finishing I.O. on the buffer head. I have a question to yes. this graph. Uh, what is on the x axis, is it uh, like sum of the times? Yes. Is it number of samples? Uh, so it is. Uh, mm -hmm. Actually, it's the number of samples. It's the number of samples. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. No, no. In this case, no. In this case, no. It, in the, this case, it is time actually. Uh, sorry. So uh, on the on CPU graphs, it is the number of samples. But in these of CPU case graphs, it is really the wall clock time, like some some of the wall clock time that was accumulated with this stack trace. So so like basically you can read it like that hundred percent uh, of the time was we actually had on the stack this function. Yeah, then like about sixty percent of the time on stack was a KC read symbol. Uh, and about 40% of the time was on stack the case is right symbol, and that's the way actually how you read it. And the way how it is done is that we actually use the scheduler system calls, so, when, so basically whenever the task state changes and we decide to schedule or reschedule a task, we gather a stack trace and record the time, and from this we actually extract uh, how frequently we were sleeping with which stack trace. And similarly for the wake up path, basically we trace the scheduler and whenever a wake up is generated by the scheduler, we record the stack trace and record the time when this happened and how long the task was sleeping before it was woken up. And that's why we, how we generate the x-axis for the wake up stuff. But here in the chain graph actually, uh, you will see only one stack trace here always because otherwise it would be barely readable. So, so here uh, there is only one stack trace generated for the most common actually waker. Yes. So here we wouldn't see if there were more wakers. In the previous, like here when I was speaking about the wake, uh, here when we have only the wake up stacks, here you would get like all the wakers, and again the x x axis would mean the total time that was spent by the sleeping process before it was woken by a process with this stack trace. Thank you. On a similar note, can you explain what do the different colors mean? I mean the darker ones and lighter ones? Uh, so, uh, so, you know, uh, the color palette, uh, so this means that, like, the, this is totally different, means that this is a waker, this is a, the process that was sleeping, yeah? that, that, that's, I guess, obvious. Uh, I believe there is no, 
no strong meaning uh, between these various shades of the same blue. It's just to make it like visually easily readable. Yeah, I, I don't think, at least I'm not aware of any like, I believe it just rotates in, in these like shades of blue just rotate in more or less random manner uh, in such a way so that you can see that there is a difference between these columns essentially uh, to make the columns like more separated visually from one another. It doesn't show any, I, I don't think it shows any, anything like related to the time or something like that. Okay, we are almost out of time, but we are almost also uh, done. So let me maybe spend a minute or two on writing your own eBPF scripts. So uh, yeah, as I already mentioned, there are two parts of this. Yeah, There is like the C part that's compiled into eBPF and loaded into the kernel. Uh, essentially, you can Im it's essentially similar to the, what used to be stuff like system tab and stuff like this, like kernel debugging modules, but just done in a more like portable way, let's say. And then the Python part which processes this. Uh, now you, you can download this, to this tool if you want to have a look, but probably we don't have to time to go through it now, but essentially the tool just dumps how many system calls there are, uh, of each particular type uh, and what was the total time in nanoseconds that was spent in the system call of this type by the particular process. Uh, so this tool basically has some like stuff in the beginning, like some boilerplate code that's not very interesting. The only interesting part is on the second line, which is highlighted in red, that basically you need to uh, you need to use the BCC class and import from it the BPF function into Python code. The rest is basically just for whatever you need to do with the Python. Uh, then you define the C program. So basically, this is uh, I just store the C program to load into the kernel in BPF text variable, and the C program looks something like this. So there is some stuff for tracking the task, which well you can look into. But if you know kernel programming, there is nothing really that interesting. But basically, here I attached. To, uh, this is a way how you can attach to a trace point. So I attach to a trace point that is in the raw syscalls class and it's called sysenter. I can attach similarly to the sysexit system call. Uh, and here is basically a C function to call, which is defined somewhere in this part uh, with the system call ID. Yeah? And these functions basically just record the fact that this process with this PID is just, uh, and the system call ID is now in the kernel and stores the current time. And this basically, again, looks at the current time, decrements the two times and stories in another data structure. And then that, that's all that's in C. Uh, and then this is the remaining pi part in Python. So basically this line is all that's needed to load the C program into the kernel. So basically I see in the BPF text variable, there is the program code and this function takes care of compiling this, loading it into the kernel and making the BPF program run and attach to all the C probes and stuff like this. So very simple thing. Uh, and the rest basically here I'm waiting almost indefinitely yeah, until the program is interrupted. Uh, and when it is interrupted, it gathers uh, from the kernel the information that's already done under the hood by this BPF function, so as you can see, it stores it in a variable B. So it happens under the hood that if you access this B program, then these are the variables that are defined in the C program. And in this way, you can simply access the variables that were defined in your BPF program and extract the information from the end kernel into your BPF program. So very convenient. Here I uh, iterate these variables are actually the BPF hashes. So it's essentially associative array. And here I have function how I can iterate through all the items in the array and I'm just printing the contents of this array because the array is basically containing all the stuff that I need. But you can do any arbitrary post-processing of this stuff in the Python, which is obviously much easier to code than if you have to do this 
in C or on, in kernel. Yeah? So this is very, for quick coding, this is, the Python is very convenient. So, so this will then basically format the output into the form, uh, into this form, yeah, uh, to, to print the name of the task, its PID, the system call number, the count of the calls and the total time. Yeah, so that's about it. So I hope the takeaway of this is that it's really easy to make this BCC and uh, like tracing fork in our distribution kernels. So it is very convenient for quick debugging, relatively complex issues or like performance issues that need gathering a lot of data. Uh, no reboots are required of anything. As you can see, we have just installed few packages and off we go. Uh, the overhead is very low. Like it's not as low as this uh, approach Yiri has shown yesterday with his debugging module. So obviously if you write a kernel module, load it into the kernel and directly do the computation there, it's faster because you are running compiled code. Yeah? With this approach, you are still doing scripts and you have pre-compiled bytecode, but that is still get interpreted in the kernel. So it is somewhat slower, but still it's very fast. And there are a lot of helper functions available, which you can use. Uh, so actually it's pretty, you can pretty quickly script whatever you need to do inside the kernel. Uh, yeah, and he, at the bottom you can see a couple of links. Brandon Grex had a, has a great like set of pages uh, about tracing, using BCC, uh, generating flame graphs and stuff like this. If you are into this, I heartily recommend reading this. Uh, there are also repositories with BCC, where is like extensible documentation about how, how various tools can be used. And also BPF trace tool, which I didn't get to talking about today. Uh, but yeah, that's, it's kind of middle ground between the BCC tools and writing your own scripts. So, you know, it's like simplified version. So, okay, thank you for attention. And if there are any questions, yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so my question is, how are you, you so there are some really interesting things here, in particular the like off CPU and uh, off and on CPU on the same graph. I wonder if like are we in a state where we can send BCC scripts to a customer in a bug and ask them to run on their systems? And are you doing that? Like, I believe yes. Like, yeah, I believe we are in a state where we, we, can, we, can, we can just do this. Yeah. Okay. Like if they are fine, with, like they need to install a couple of packages on their system because usually they are not going to have BCC tools or, or the LLVM compiler installed. But often the customer is willing to install this, like, and if, if he's willing to install this, then yeah, he's, it, as you have seen, it works mostly out of the box. So awesome. thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is there support for extracting gathered data from a BPF program out of a crash dump of the kernel. So maybe I have some, the customer has some problem crashing the kernel in certain uh, conditions, and can I take some traces basically and then extract the data from the crash dump later? No, I, I don't think there is such thing. So, so if the kernel crashes, I don't know about an easy way how to extract, like obviously it would be possible, but I, I am not aware that anybody would have implemented this. So have, like extracting the, uh, the BPF hashes, for example, from, from the crash dump, I don't think it's implemented. So, so yeah, you, you would have to get the data out of the kernel before the system crashes. <laughs> Yeah, and um, the thing is that BPF, BPFs are essentially programs, so they require something to well, continue to work, or I, I CPU doing some work, and with CrashDump you don't have that. CrashDump is just static data, and applying a program to static data won't really help you because you're losing the CPU context. It, it should be possible if you have the same BPF program available when analyzing the dump, but I agree it might be very... Yeah. Um, it's yeah, going to be very challenging to actually yeah, somehow make this Crash work. Crash Python is your friend. Yeah. 
The objective is different. So, so it, crash, it is possible sorry. to extract the BPF data out of out of like something like Dragon or Crash, but you just have to kind of re-implement the the algorithm. So for something like BPF array, it's quite easy, but for other, it's hard. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So so yeah, it it in principle it would be possible, but it would be really complicated to make it general. So. Yeah, I was saying uh, the objectives are different. Like for BPF, it's be more like a performance tool which basically needs it to run, whereas a crash is like a snapshot of the current state of the system altogether. Yeah, so I can see how BPF can be useful by like out gathering the information while the kernel is running, but uh, in an efficient way in a kernel, like gathering debug information, yeah, instead of just performance information, yeah. But you would still, like, what you could do is, for example, gather the information in the kernel and output it every second, let's say, so that you still have, like, something in the kernel log or whatever. Uh, just you would lose some information just before the crash still. Or, or you can put the, the data into the trace buffer. Yeah, or and you then, can and then trace on on oops or what what's the option? Yeah, or or you can just generate it as a trace data. That's also true because reading of trace buffer is implemented in Crash. So if you output the data regularly in the in the trace buffer, then that would actually work. That's actually a good suggestion. Okay, thank you for attention, and I'm already 10 minutes over. Uh, I'm holding, oh, Hannes, okay. <laughs>